Hi there, I'm Mike Brown of Greenberg Consultants, and with a career spanning 35 years in market research, I've worked in a range of large research agencies, as well as 12 years at Cobalt Sky in a mix of production, strategy and sales roles. The route I've taken is through operations, from data collection via telephone, face-to-face -face, and online, into managing, cleaning and processing reporting data for insights. More recently, at Cantar, my responsibility was looking to the horizon on methodology and technology for insights. From quick turn survey solutions, video, chatbots, behavioural data, all were built and evaluated as being part of my role as Director of Technology Enabled Research in the Cantar Insights Division. I started Greenberg Consultants in late 2019 to bring the range of skills to a wider set of clients, focusing on utilising behavioural, passively collected data to benefit businesses and a personal waving the flag for location data. Of course, 2020 didn't help my early days when the world stopped moving around and sharing my own location was on the lines of bedroom to bathroom to kitchen to home office to sitting room to, well, you get the picture and you certainly live the same world as me. We did not lead location-based insights. Or did we? The UK government introduced a lockdown, but not a curfew. How effective was the messaging? One of my data and analytics partners could actually see how people were still moving around the UK. Real data showing distances travelled, times of day and locations, rather than what people were telling research businesses through surveys. So although the world stopped, as we know, it didn't. Anyway, that's enough about me. And now I want to move on to the focus of this session. To kick things off, I'm setting boundaries. So you're all clear on what I'm talking about when I'm referring to passive or behavioral data. I'm not talking about harvested data, which you might get from website scraping or a pipe from, for example, a social media monitoring tool like Bramwatch. With that data, people are posting responses comments, their opinions and attitudes. They're actively sharing commentary, be it in text, audio or video, on the basis it will be available to view by other users of a platform or a subscription community. In some ways, it is a different approach to traditional quantitative research, where we pose questions and seek feedback through a survey. Much as I do believe in that approach for gathering opinions, today is not my time to be talking about these approaches. No, what I'm talking about is data where we gather passively from users' behaviour unencumbered to an extent by their opinions and biases. Whether it be the all surrounding world of apps, taxi hailing through Uber, shopping through Amazon, consuming endless hours of comedy shows on Netflix, all the things we do with our phones, laptops and tablets can be gathered in a compliant and permission based way. As well as seeing app activity, this could be search behaviour, websites visited and hovered around, essentially watching what people do without the need to sit next to them. And look over their shoulder as folks are keen to do on the bus. Although obviously this is slightly harder now with the space we are creating for each other through social distancing. And not only that, but we can also see what the device is and very importantly for insights, where it is. And we know what information about the consumer exists in terms of demographics are too, which can be overlaid. So if we have all this data available to us, how do we go about gathering it, managing it, processing, reporting it? Well, several of you will be doing that already as you will have your own properties like a website and app. I'm hoping if you do have those in place, you're getting the most out of the data you're collecting through those channels. However, that is within your ownership, first party data collected from your own customers who are sharing their activity with you, like what they are putting in their virtual baskets, what route they take to get to your contact details for feedback and complaints, how much time they're spending on your property while using your products and even within your physical sites. That is all good data and will help you understand your customers better. However, what about competitors? What happens when they navigate away from your owned property and how about the route they take to come back to your app or website? 
If I'm a quick term restaurant chain owner, how do I know what share of my customer's time I'm getting and what share of revenue? Am I able to understand customers who might come to my physical site, but also order online through channels like Deliveroo? And for those prospects who might be in my competitor set, how best do I target my advertising to find them and persuade them to buy with me? Of course, traditional methodologies like surveys and qualitative techniques can help, but that relies on consumers being able to tell me about their lives. Within the constraints of a box, we have to put together to gather the information. And remembering all those details of the routes taken to ordering from the restaurant, whether it be yours or your competitors. Afraid to say that it's not only hard, but it's not a worthwhile investment of your money. So if we want to research an insights need that can be better resolved by using behavioural data, where should we start? From looking at Mike Stevens' website, Insight Platforms, in early June, a search for the word behavioural took me to 33 results in passive metering and behavioural tracking category. From full-blown behavioural panels down, to, down into behavioural tracking technology, views of IoT data, there are products, platforms and businesses to get your head around. However, this is 33 results out of, at the time, 1,116 in total across the Insights framework. And gosh, if I type eye chip tracking, that produces 33 different solutions in what I would consider a niche area. So I would say that as much as we've been talking about and using this behavioural data approaches for years in research, it is still to a major extent an uncovered opportunity. If you can find the right key to unlock insights that are often hard to gain from traditional quantitative and qualitative techniques. I tend to break down the sources and providers of insights into the space under three under different types of businesses. All have their own degrees of excellence based on the length and breadth of data available, how it is collected in a permissions and compliant way, and importantly, what can be done with it in terms of informing insights. Making all this work in a lot of ways is like traditional quantitative work in that you have specialists in finding the participants, screening them and getting them to install metering technology. Think here of consumer access panels like Respondi, with survey panels who have a small proportion of people being metered. There are also panels set up purely as behavioural data businesses, where participants do not get involved in wider survey taking tasks, but can be asked questions specific to the data needed for the project, and with businesses here like Measure Protocol and MB. Then metering technology companies themselves are experts in the data tech, gathering space like Reality Mine. Beyond the normal horizon of market research, there are businesses like Bliss and Tomoko, who take data feeds, have their own panels where people have agreed to share information by using an app, perhaps free with adverts, free from adverts, rather than paid for ad free and homogenize and clean to get accurate estimates of location. That's what Bliss and Tomoko do, and then create reports to demonstrate how consumers are behaving in the physical as well as digital space. Then mobile networks. They also work in a comparable way, taking customer data and enabling insights to be gathered from that base. In all cases, you end up with huge quantities of data, whether that be long, so many thousands or millions of records, or a wide data set, hundreds of data points about an individual and their activity. So all in all, this is important to have a clear picture of where you're aiming for. Why are you doing the research? What are the goals of the research? Does that sound familiar? Just the same guidance would apply to any client looking to understand consumers. Here are some things to consider when approaching businesses in this space, above and beyond what you might normally look for, so like countries or markets. I will talk to some of these questions now. So do you need survey alongside passive data? Well, if you already have a lot of opinion and attitude data about your audience, choosing not to ask any further questions can make access to behavioural data easier, as it will widen your choice of partner. What about how much data and how many users you need? As with any research project, try to be clear on what is needed rather than ask for everything from as many people as you can. This will certainly help with your budgeting, not only for the sourcing of data, but also processing and analysing it. 
And is the data, or can it be, historical? Some businesses will have volumes of data on a consumer audience, while others will be starting from scratch. Again, again, as with your traditional research needs, plan chronology, so the timeline of what you need. Some further considerations. So browser and search data. As I mentioned earlier, some technology will look historically. For instance, you might get a partner who can source search and browser activity via a plugin and can be consented to at a point in the survey. Be aware here, though, that although the technology may pull past information, if users clear their search and settings history, you may find very little activity. Then there is the whole engineering and management side of things. All in all, a long list of considerations when working in this space. My point is, it's worth it. Now I want to share some use cases where usage of digital behavioural data becomes valuable beyond the examples already mentioned earlier in the presentation. At the beginning of 2019, Le Banquin asked Respondi France to design and conduct research on 18 to 25 year olds. The purpose was to get a better understanding of their online shopping behaviour and expectations and to focus on their interest for secondhand products and the use of online marketplaces. A challenge for traditional approaches. That is why they opted for a two step programme. The first stage of the research consists of backtracking the online usage of the appropriate target group, that's young French internet users. From the list of URLs visited with corresponding timestamps, plus the activity on mobile apps and its duration, this step provided them with facts about shopping habits and customer journeys based on the recording of their entire surfing sessions down to the order of pages browsed. The next step consisted of an online community that combined live qualitative moderation by Respondi's team with closed questions entitling a quantitative assessment of the community's insights and opinions. After a successful project, here are some of the conclusions and learnings that helped out Le Banquin adapt their proposition to meet the consumer's needs. Now onto an example of Formula One motor racing. Like many TV broadcasters, Formula One are challenged with how to make their product as exciting and as engaging as possible for the fans, who now have so much choice of what to watch and when to watch it via streaming services or video on demand services. And rather than rely on traditional research approaches, using reported behaviours to understand their experience, the Insights team at F1 partnered with Walnut Unlimited and Reality Mine on a dual pronged approach. Firstly, by asking race fans in the US to download the Reality Mine passive metering app onto their various digital devices during two full race weekends. This allowed them to map exactly what Formula One related content was being consumed at what times, from which channels and brands, and on what platforms. It was analysis of this complex but highly valuable data that enabled them to work together to establish the key moments during a race weekend for certain types of content and which brands were currently fulfilling these needs and identify opportunities for F1. And at the same time, in-home ethnography using eye-tracking glasses with a small number of fans in Germany allowed the team to bring to life exactly how secondary screens and information sources are used during a Grand Prix to support and enhance the experience of the fan. It got this feedback from the head of F1. Now onto an example from Measure Protocol and one of their media clients. The client runs a weekly tracker and wanted to find a way for younger audiences to, part, to take part in their brand tracker. They were struggling with low participation rates due to long questionnaires and incorrect and sometimes incomplete information. Measure Protocol captured all the subscription based video on demand through Netflix and Amazon Prime. As you can see again, a positive outcome for Measure Protocol's client, and I want to highlight the engagement with the audience, which we know is so important when we want to get through to authentic, valuable research. Next up, during 2020, 
CK Delta and a Danish client looked at the immediate impact of COVID-19 on travel patterns in Denmark using location data through the three mobile network. They built a tourist, tourism insights dashboard to enable a client to look at domestic as well as international entry, travel patterns and exit from the country. This allowed the client to postcode, at postcode level to understand a consumer's appetite for moving around and within their country. So you see here, not only do we see where people go, it's what, where they visit, their points of interest. And then my final example today is a location-based insights example again from Tomoko working with Kia. That team worked on the data collected via an SDK in apps to understand the impact of advertising on driving footfall into dealerships. Again, showing the power of this type of location data, not only to see activity around Kia dealerships, but you can also look at activity at other brands and dealership. So emphasizing this is actual rather than claimed behavior. There's, there is the ability to see who visit multiple dealerships, for example. And this was also shared through a dashboard, making it easy to slice and dice the impact across different dem demographic groups. So to wrap things up, there are several areas which will influence our ability to work with passive data for insights. Firstly, consumer participation, and importantly, their consent. In an online access panel world, once permission is obtained, tracking continues until a consumer changes their preferences or acts. Once their data is in the machine, it keeps on coming until they decide to stop it. While this is great for research, as participants may forget they're given this data, meaning it is unbiased. However, is it right? Companies like Measure Protocol have behavioral panels where individual, every individual piece of work is consented to. And Owen Hanks, their CEO, laid it out very well with three points in a recent article on AI authority as, giving consumers custody and control over their own data, baking privacy into systems and processes to meet what will certainly become increased consumer demands, and providing a clear window into how data is being used in a safe way that doesn't compromise privacy. Then we look at tech companies who own and root a lot of this data. Apple recently gave even more onus on our choice with how the data we create is handled. For example, trying to remove tracking pixels from email. Google are on the same path and the cookie world is gradually being eaten away. In any case, building technology to stitch together the different websites, apps and devices we use isn't going to get easier. But again, with the right partner, remember whose business depends on handling these challenges, you can work through this process. Finally, I want to reference our appetite to cross the line into the world of using digital behavioural data. The first project where I used web user data was around 10 years ago. In the time since, I don't think this has become as much part as a good researcher's toolkit as it should. We know now how things can be done, the benefits of using the technology and the data for insights and the value they can bring to business. So I recommend we grasp the metal of behavioural data and everything it can mean to business, as well as keeping our eyes wide open for opportunity to benefit clients. It could even create a different differentiator from your competition. Now I'd like to thank Ray and Sue, New MR, for giving me the opportunity to share my thoughts today and look forward to hearing and hopefully answering some of the questions now. Thank you. <laughs>